title of my lecture tonight, Opposition Russia, the Trials of Alexei Navalny. Now, I want to start by reminding you of a, um, an extraordinary, extraordinary story. It's 20, 20th of August, 2020. Alexei Navalny, the very, very well-known opposition activist, politician, campaigner, has flown to Tomsk in Siberia to make a film about local corruption in that city. On the plane back to Moscow, uh, he starts howling and crying in pain. And in fact, if one, one looks onto the internet, one can see video taken by people on the plane and hearing those terrible cries of pain uh, being emitted by Mr. Navalny. The flight diverts to the nearest airport at Omsk, another city uh, relatively close by to Tomsk, where Navalny is rushed to hospital. He's now in a coma. The doctors who tend to him assert that no trace of poison can be found. They suggest, possibly and probably, that his condition may have been caused by low blood sugar levels. Navalny is, at the time, a fit and healthy man in his early 40s. Navalny's wife, Yulia, arrives swiftly from Moscow. The hospital seems to now be filled more with police officers than doctors or nurses. The authorities demand proof from Yulia, Navalny's wife, that she is indeed his wife. They also say, well, Mr. Navalny hasn't given permission uh, for you to see him, which I suppose is a fair point, given that he was at the time in a coma and unable to give affirmative assent to his wife visiting him in his uh, hospital room. A couple of days pass, and after considerable international pressure, Navalny is released from the hospital at Omsk and flown to Germany to be cared for by German doctors in Berlin. But the clothes he was wearing at the time of uh, uh, the crisis, the medical crisis, in the aeroplane are removed and seized by the Russian authorities. Now, we move to Berlin. Toxicological tests show that Navalny has been uh, uh, indeed poisoned with a type of Novichok nerve agent. And you'll remember that this was the same substance that was used in an attempt to murder Sergei Skripal in Salisbury in 2018. Now, let's just quickly, there's, there's uh, Navalny in his capacity as protester and, and politician. Here is Navalny now in early September 2020, after he has been uh, brought out of a medically induced coma, which happens on the 7th of September, so a considerable period of time after the original crisis. And he is discharged from his hospital on the 22nd of September, so a full month after the event occurred on the aeroplane. Clearly, a very serious medical incident has occurred for Mr. Navalny. And in fact, the investigation that is subsequently carried out by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons concludes that the Novichok that was used was a previously unknown variant, more toxic and dangerous than existing uh, versions as they were then known. And they conclude that it had been, must have been intended by whoever carried out the poisoning that Navalny would die on the plane as it headed from Tomsk to Moscow. The only reason it is concluded that Navalny survived at all was a combination of two very quick decisions. First, the decision of the pilot of the aeroplane to make that emergency landing at Omsk. And secondly, the decision of the doctors at the hospital at Omsk to inject Navalny, possibly fearing something might have happened, with atropine, uh, uh, an antidote against the kind of nerve agent that is uh, Novichok, which when he originally and initially arrived at hospital. Now, after Navalny is released from hospital in Germany, he remains on German soil in order to regain his health. It's still very, very weak for a protracted period of time. And while he's regaining his health in Germany, he starts investigating 
the circumstances of his poisoning. And with the assistance of journalists and the investigative website Bellingcat, which many of you will, of course, will know about, he makes quite extraordinary discoveries about the identity of the assassination squad that had tried to kill him. And his team tracks down, quite extraordinarily, their names, their mobile phone numbers, and their movements over the last two or three years. Amazing what you can do on the internet. Um, and it turns out, according to these investigations, that uh, a team of about eight members of the FSB, that is the Russian Security Service, have been tracking Navalny for a period of about three years, crisscrossing Russia, um, where he was you know, on his various missions and journeys. Um, by contrast to these investigations, the Russian police uh, carry out their own supposed investigation of what well, on the face of it is a, an assassination or murder attempt. Um, they quickly close their file on the grounds that it had been found that there was no sign of any crime having been committed whatsoever. Now, there is about Navalny's protest efforts and, cam and campaigning a, a performative element in a lot of what he does. He's an extraordinarily uh, um, charismatic and amusing figure in many respects. And in a remarkable coup de théâtre, he, start, he decides to telephone each of the members of the assassination squad, whose phone numbers have been located through the efforts, efforts of Bellingcat. And um, he decides to do so posing as a particular individual within the governmental bureaucracy. And these phone calls are filmed, as many of you will know, because you've, you'll have seen the film, which I'm going to come on to mention. And he sits in his German house, where he's recovering. He makes phone calls to each of the members of the supposed assassination squad. Most of them don't respond to his questions, but one of them, thinking that Navalny is a, 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 a high-up member of the, of the Russian bureaucracy and government, demanding to know, as Navalny is in his pose, what on earth happens to that mission at Tomsk, um, he gets somebody to talk. And you can hear it, it's available on the internet now, this, this phone conversation. And the, the operative who he gets to talk, the operative, of course, not realising that it is in fact the victim or the proposed victim speaking to him, it rather opens up in an extraordinary way. The conversation is a, is a long conversation, which I won't quote in full, of course, but there is a, a, a he, the, the, this individual uses some remarkable, I think the phrase is circumlocutions, and I quote, well, they landed the plane and the situation developed in a way that was not in quite in our favour, uh, I think. If it had been a little longer, I think the situation could have gone differently. I, if the plane hadn't landed and it had gone a little longer, the situation could have gone rather differently. We know what that means. Um, the conversation then moves into the realms of the surreal. And I've quoted a passage here, which I hope you can see. Um, N is Navalny. K is the operative who is being spoken to. And on what piece of cloth was your focus on? This, is, this operative had been... Uh, tasked with clearing things up at Tomsk. Um, which garment had the highest risk factor? K, the underpants. N, the underpants. K, a risk factor in what sense? N, that's Navalny. Where the concentration of Novichok could be highest? Well, the underpants. Do you mean from the inner side or from the outer? Well, we were processing the inner side. That is where we were, what, it, what we were doing. Well, imagine some underpants in front of you. Which part did you process? Well, the inner, where the groin is. The groin, says Navalny having to suppress his laughter. Well, the crotch, as they call it, so I'm, there is some sort of seams there. There, by the seams. Uh, the conversation lasts for a lot longer, but the, essentially, as many of you will, 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 of course, know, it turns out that the, the way that the Novichok was sought to be introduced into Navalny's body was via a pair of underpants, which I presume had been uh, uh, had been laundered in the hotel he was staying in Omsk and had been laced and he put the pants on and the idea was that he would slowly die while he was in uh, airborne between Tomsk and, and Moscow and I mentioned the film uh, you can there's an extraordinary uh, film made about 
um, the Valve, you know, made about that, this particular event, which was um, released earlier this year, which you can see still on the, on the BBC iPlayer. And it's, a, it's a, an astonishing film, and I would very much recommend, recommend it to you as a very interesting, very, very interesting documentary indeed. Um, now, what is astonishing thereafter is that once Navalny has regained his strength, he decides to return to Russia. And he does so having publicly accused the president of Russia of having himself personally ordered Navalny's murder and knowing that he will almost certainly be arrested on his return to Russia, um, despite the fact, of course, that he is himself has been the victim of a very serious, very serious crime. And so on the 17th of January of 2021, last year, Navalny takes a flight from Berlin Airport to Russia. The flight is due to arrive at Vunokovo Airport in Moscow, and his large body of, of supporters gather to give him a welcome to, back to Russia. The flight is then uh, diverted for supposed technical reasons to another airport where the protesters, or not the protesters, the supporters, of course, are not. Um, and the, this is all being photographed, this is all being filmed by the, the documentary makers. We see this in real time. He disembarks with his wife at, at the, the new airport. Uh, and of course, he is, uh, as he had predicted and knew, immediately arrested. And there we see a photograph of the, uh, the very welcoming um, committee, uh, uh, which was uh, uh, welcoming uh, Mr. Navalny back to back to Russia after his near-death experience. And you may ask, well, what, what was he being arrested for? Well, given the story that I've so far unfolded to you, the answer may not be surprising, although I think it's still pretty shocking. We go back six years. Navalny had, uh, in 2013, been uh, prosecuted and received a suspended sentence of three and a half years in prison in a criminal prosecution known as the Yves Rocher case. Um, Yves Rocher being, a, being a, a French cosmetics firm that had a, had a, a Russian um, subsidiary. Now, the terms of that suspension of his three-and-a-half-year prison sentence were that he was obliged to report physically to a probation officer in Moscow once every two weeks in lieu of serving his sentence in prison. Now, Navalny was now being arrested six, seven years later because um, having been outside of Mos Russia for the five months between August 2020 and January 2021, he had violated the terms of his probation because he'd failed physically to attend the probation officer's office in Moscow in that period. One might have thought he had quite a good excuse, but no. He's arrested by these very welcome and gen welcoming gentlemen, and he appears in a Moscow court on the 2nd of February 2021, so 14 days after his arrival back in Moscow. And there is a photograph of, of Navalny in the Moscow courtroom on the 2nd of February 2021. And it is held and decided by the judge in Moscow on that date that because of his breaches of the terms of his suspended sentence in the Yves Rocher case back in 2013, he must be returned to prison and his suspended sentence activated, i.e. he is now sentenced to serve the full period of that sentence that was passed on him in suspension six or seven years earlier. Now, at the time... Navalny described the judge's decision as, quotes, ultimate lawlessness. Uh, and one can certainly feel some degree of sympathy for that, uh, for that characterization. It was a remarkable thing to do to a man who had suffered, uh, on any view, a serious medical crisis. Um, remember, he had been taken from Russia to Germany while he was in a coma. So he wasn't in a position to make a decision one way or other, whether he was going to Russia, whether to Germany, Britain or United States or staying in Russia. And had been taken to Germany with the full acquiescence of the Russian authorities at the time to save his life, as it proved. Many Russians 
took the same view as Navalny as to the astonishingness of that uh, sentence. And protests uh, ensued on the streets of Moscow on, on the 2nd of February, and 1,500 people were detained uh, that, that evening. Now, as we're going to discover, one of the key weapons utilised by the Russian state against those who seek to resist or challenge the status quo is the law and the criminal and civil courts of Russia. And when I tell you that the conviction rate in the Russian criminal courts overall is 99.8%, you will immediately see that the kind of the court system that one is dealing with in Russia now is very far removed from the court systems of the West or of England. Now, before I carry on, let me say just a few words about um, Alexei Navalny, very briefly. He's a famous figure, of course, and you'll, you'll, I, I know that you'll know quite a lot about him already. He was born in Moscow in 1976, studied law and then finance, and in the 1990s was a very vigorous supporter of President Yeltsin's free market reforms. And he joined a small liberal party at, at, at the time. Uh, he flirted for a while with nationalist politics, uh, and there's been a lot written about that, and then became, or at the same time became, a minority shareholder and anti-corruption campaigner. So he would attend the, the, the general meetings of Russian companies uh, as a, having bought a, a small shareholding in the company and demand to know why, given that the, the company was making very substantial profits, why were none of the profits being delivered back to the shareholders by way of dividends? That was one of his campaigns. So accountability within the nascent capitalist system of Russia. He also became very well known, as you will, of course, all know very well, as an anti-corruption campaigner. Um, he started investigating state contracts, in, on the face of it, inflated state contracts to people connected to the Russian state. He, he even set up a website tracking the existence of potholes on the streets of Russia, demanding to know why they hadn't been filled in. Lots of photographs, interesting photographs of potholes in, in towns of, the towns of Russia. Um, and he, he really understood at a relatively early stage the immense power of the internet. And he, he became very well known, as you're sure you've seen some of his videos, for his, the videos he would make about corruption, the corruption of state officials and politicians in Russia. And um, he would narrate them with black humour and irony. So they were, they're, rather, they're, they're not only appalling things to watch, they're also quite amusing things to watch in a sort of black way at the, sa at the same time, exposing the corruption in, in, in the Russian state. And you, his most famous video, his most infamous video, depending on which side you're on, was that about Dmitry Medvedev, who you'll recall was the pro former president and prime minister of, uh, of Russia. He made a video called Don't Call Him Dimon, um, which is a joke about his about about uh, Mr. Medev, Medyev's sir, uh, first name and the diminutive there, thereof, um, and in it he claims to trace the vast quantities, so he claimed, of Mr. Medyev's supposedly ill-gotten wealth. Um, the video has attracted, by when I looked this morning, 45 million views on YouTube so far, and I'm hoping this lecture will have a similar effect. Um, <laughs> Now, such is Navalny's chutzpah, chutzpah, I should say, that two days after he returns to Moscow on the 17th of January from his sojourn for, for health reasons in Germany, his organi and he's now in prison, of course, he's on in detention, his organisation issues a video now about the supposed wealth of the president himself. And um, it's a video which has uh, uh, attracted, apparently, 100 million views within the first week or two of it being released onto the internet. And it's, it's called Putin's Palace, History of the World's Largest Bribe. And it's all about this extraordinarily, on one view, vulgar palace on the Black Sea, which, uh, according to the video, cost $1 billion to build. And if one looks on the internet about it, it has the most preposterous quantity of sort of, you know, Forget about cinema, you know, multiple cinemas and all the various accoutrements of an of a, of a oligarch's residence. Um, a remarkable video. You may think not necessarily the best timing 
to release that video when he's facing a, pr a criminal prosecution. But that's, that's the man that Alexei Navalny is, not somebody to run away from danger or jeopardy. Now, I want to now, having spent a little time about Navalny, I want to go back to that, that case that I mentioned, the one that saw him receiving the two and a half, the three and a half year uh, suspended sentence, what known as the Eve Roche case. It tells you quite a lot about the way the Russian system, the legal system, can work. Now, let's say one thing immediately. Throughout his life, his, his adult life, Navalny has been dogged by multiple prosecutions and indeed civil, civil actions uh, as well. The one I'm going to mention briefly is the, suppose, is the, the so-called Eve Roche case. Now, it related to a contract uh, between a company run by Mr. Navalny's brother and the Russian subsidiary of this cosmetics firm, uh, Yves Rocher. And it was a very, very uninteresting contract. It was an a contract, essentially, where the company said, we will deliver your parcels for you in Russia for a fixed price. A and so under that contract, Navalny's brother's company says, we will charge you X number of rubles per delivery. And it then went ahead and subcontracted that work to another unrelated company in Russia for a lower price. Why number of rubles? And hey, presto, the profit it made was the difference between the price it charged Yves Rocher and the price that it, it charged or it was charged to it by its subcontractor. Now, I mention this because on the face of it, the facts of the case are staggeringly banal. They are simply the workings of the market economy. And Yves Rocher, I should say, made no suggestion at all that it had been in any way defrauded. Yet, just after Navalny, in his capacity as an anti-corruption campaigner, had looked into the activities of the chief of the investigative committee of the Russian Federation, a very important individual, a very important role, a Mr. Bastarikin, hey presto, Navalny finds himself being charged alongside his brother with fraud and embezzlement in relation to this contract. He is placed, Navalny is placed for a year in, under house arrest pending the trial of the action. And he is convicted, and as you know, and as I mentioned, he finds himself uh, sentenced to this suspended prison sentence. Now, he challenges his conviction before the European Court of Human Rights, which Russia technically is a signatory to the convention and technically accepts the jurisdiction of the European Court in Strasbourg, just like all other, or virtually all other European states. Um, and in a judgment delivered in 2017, the court held that his and his brother's conviction was an infringement of Article 7 of the convention. Um, I should have told you, showed you this earlier. There it is. There's the mansion in, in oh, it's just worth every, every penny of that, every cent of that billion dollars. Um, that's, that, that's the so-called mansion by the very nice Black Sea there. Um, we're now onto the convention. So Article 7, no one shall be held guilty of any criminal offence on account of any act or omission which did not constitute a criminal offence under national or international law at the time when it was committed, nor shall a heavier penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time, at the, time the criminal offence was committed. So far, so obvious, you might say. And here's a passage from the judgment of the ECHR in that particular decision. The court reiterates that the guarantee enshrined in Article 7 of the Convention is an essential element of the rule of law. It should be construed and applied as follows. But as follows from its object and purpose, in such a way as to provide effective safeguards against arbitrary prosecution, conviction and punishment. Article 7 is not confined to prohibiting the retroactive application of criminal law to the disadvantage of an accused. It also embodies more generally the principle that only the law can define a crime and prescribe a penalty. And the principle that criminal law must not be extensively construed to the detriment of an accused, for instance, by analogy. For these reasons, for these principles, it follows that an offence must be clearly defined in law. Now, what point is being made there? Well, the point that was being made there is that the, the activity of Navalny and his brother in entering into this entirely banal and uninteresting commercial contract back in, 2012, and back, back in 2008, it was that long ago, um, it was impossible for them to foresee 
based on the law as it then stood, that their activities could subsequently be characterized as criminal. They were engaging in what was a purely ordinary commercial activity, which had been, to their detriment, interpreted subsequent to the event by the Russian court as criminal. Now, you may say to me, well, what? So what? So what? This is just a criminal court in Russia misinterpreting the law happens all the time. That's what appeals are there for. That's what the ESHR is there for. Well, it goes worse than that. It gets worse than that in the case of Navalny. And there's another case I wanted to mention which was brought against him. Um, it wasn't the, the Yves Rocher case was not the first time he had been prosecuted in a Russian court for fraud and embezzlement. Let me go back to 2012 now, a year before the Yves Rocher case. By this time, Navalny was a genuinely nationwide known and prominent political figure. He's been leading the protests and rallies that occurred when President Putin was elected uh, as president in March 2012. He's been imprisoned for short periods of time for participating in unlawful gatherings. And it was at this stage that he is charged with another embezzlement uh, 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 prosecution, this time in relation to a timber factory. Again, the facts are trivial. In 2008, he advises the timber factory, which is making losing money hand over fist, that in order to attract customers, it would be advisable for the timber factory to enter into a contract with a sales company that knows how to sell timber. So he suggest, makes this suggestion, and a, 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 he suggests an associate of his who has a sales company who enters into a contract with a timber company to buy the timber at rate X, and the, tim and the sales company then tries to sell it on the open market at rate Y. And g guess what? Rate X and rate Y are different because they allow for a profit to be made by the sales company. And some profits are indeed made. And he and the associate who runs the company are again charged with embezzlement, essentially on the basis that they had defrauded the timber company by buying at X rubles and selling at Y rubles. Um, now, investigations occur uh, about the, these events. And for two years, the local police can find no crime. They can find no crime at all. Then, in July 2012, the, ch the, the chief of the investigative committee, the, the gentleman we've already met, Mr. Bastarikin, speaks at its general meeting. And the investigative committee is a centralised criminal uh, investigation body of immense power. And Bastarikin's not happy that for two years the, police, the local police have not been able to find any crime. And he, he makes his unhappiness known. You've got a man there called Navalny, the criminal case. Why have you terminated it without asking the investigative committee superiors? Today, the whole country, apparently, is discussing this fraud. The talks between Mr. Navalny and Mr. Bellick, who's the, 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 the gentleman at the timber company, have been published, and we cannot hear anything except grunting. You had a criminal file against this man, and you've quietly closed it. I'm warning you that there'll be no mercy, no forgiveness if such things happen again. If you have grounds to close it, report it. Feeling weak, afraid, under pressure, report. We'll help support you. Take over the file. But quietly like that, no, no, no. And there's Mr. Bastarikin with... There we are, in discussions with, with the president. Um, so this is one way that criminal investigations are conducted in the Russian Federation now. And you won't be surprised to hear that, that after Mr. Bastarikin made his displeasure known, and it's fair to say after Navalny had responded by publishing a further video about Mr. Bastarikin's supposed ill-gotten gains, Mr. Navalny and his uh, associate are charged with conspiring to dissipate the assets of the timber company. His trial commences in 2013. There is Navalny in the courtroom in 2013. At the time, he is running to be mayor of Moscow, running in the election to be mayor of Moscow. He is sentenced to five years in prison, again suspended for embezzlement. 
And it's noted at the time that the, the judge who convicts him of this separate offence has conducted 130 trials in his professional career. So he's a very experienced judge. And it's also noted that he has found the defendant guilty on 130 occasions. Um, nonetheless, Navalny continues with his mayoral campaign. It's a very important event. And emerges, despite everything, with 27% of the vote, which uh, I haven't got time to go into, but in the circumstances are extremely commendable uh, 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 result for him. Now, Navalny again takes his case to the European Court of Human Rights in this, regard, in this case as well and says this is a patently political conviction uh, and, and patently in breach of my Article 6 rights to a fair trial. And again, the European Court has cause to consider one of Mr Navalny's complaints and again rules in his favour and against the Russian state. And we have the uh, passage of the judgment. Courts found the second applicant, who was the, the associate, guilty of acts indist indistinguishable from regular commercial middleman activities. And the first applicant for fostering them. The court considers in the present case the questions of interpretation and application of national law go beyond a regular assessment of the applicant's individual criminal responsibility or the establishment of corpus delicti, matters which are pre predominantly primarily within the domestic court's domain, is confronted with a situation where the acts described as criminal fell entirely outside the scope of the provision under which the applicants were convicted and were not concordant, concordant with its intended aim. In other words, the criminal law was arbitrarily and unforeseeably construed to the detriment of the applicants, leading to a manifestly unreasonable outcome um, at, of, at, at, at the trial. Now, What I think is interesting about these two cases, the, the Timber case and the Yves Rocher case, is that in both, in both instances, Navalny was not being prosecuted overtly and directly for his political activities. He was being prosecuted on the face of it for entirely unrelated commercial fraud, utterly disconnected from his public Persona, and what I think, I think that's a, that's some, there's, there's significance in that. Because I think what it shows, it demonstrates the willingness of the Russian courts and the, and the Russian prosecution authorities to criminalise ordinary activities in order to try and suppress and delegitimize dissenters. And these prosecutions, and I should say there are many, many other civil claims that have been brought against Navalny, which I haven't got time to go into, have also had the effect of entangling Navalny and people like him in endless protracted disputes. And I know as a lawyer, and I'm sure many of you know as well, litigation, whatever the outcome of that litigation, itself is stressful, costly, and hugely time-consuming. And it, the, the litigation itself, irrespective of the outcome, is a form of silencing the defendant to that litigation. Because to use that phrase, people have limited bandwidth. And if you're being constantly being oppressed uh, and entangled with the business of litigation, your ability to concentrate on anything else, of course, is substantially diminished. Um, the prosecutions also served another purpose. And we find that out a couple of years later. We're in 2016 now. Navalny has fought the mayoral election two or three years earlier, and I told you the result. He now has his sight set even higher, the presidency of Russia itself. And the election takes place every six years. The election is due to take place in March 2018. And Navalny announces his candidature in December of 2016 and devotes the next year to this substantial undertaking. Now, his candidature is derailed, and it's derailed in these circumstances, that after the ECHR's decision in the Timber case, which effectively, had the, effectively annulled his conviction, the Russian courts responded by trying him again for the same crime. There's a trial in February 2017. He is again convicted and sentenced again to a suspended sentence of five years. But by this time, the law has been changed so that anyone convicted of a prison sentence, whether suspended or not, is debarred from running in a presidential election. 
So the Electoral Committee announce four months before the election is due to take place. And after Navalny has spent an awful lot of time and energy running his campaign and increasing his, his, um, uh, uh, his public recognition, the Electoral Commission decide and announce that he is disentitled from running for president. So these, the, the effect of these convictions, far removed in one sense from the political domain, is actually immediate and political in the sense that he is effectively disabled from running. And he, I think by common consent at the time, he was the best shot anyone had at fighting the election against President Putin. Now, during that campaign, I want to move on to another subject. During that campaign, during 2017, when Navalny's crisscrossing Russia, talking about his anti-corruption message, talking about his policies, he, he finds himself in a town in, Siber in Siberia, and he's attacked by an unknown assailant. You can see it on video. It's, it, was t it was filmed um, by chance, and he's attacked, and he's doused with green antiseptic. And there, that's a photograph taken after the attack against him. And you see his, one of his eyes is closed up and caused him quite serious damage to one of his eyes. Um, an unknown assailant commits this um, assault upon him. Now, the result is that all over Russia, his supporters start posting photographs of themselves painted with green faces to show their solidarity with Navalny in his current plight. Um, and one of, one of his closest associates, his campaign manager, a man called Alexei Volkov, circulates online as a sign of solidarity with his friend and associate, uh, a photoshopped image of a famous statue known as Motherland Calls. Now, let's look at the, um, there's the statue, 85 meters high. It's the, it's the tallest statue, and this is a fa one fact you will learn this evening. It is the tallest statue in Europe, but, but not the world, although it was the tallest statue in the world for a long period of time. And uh, it's, it's in Volgograd, what used to be known as Stalingrad, and a great patriotic statue. And it's fair to say it carries a lot of uh, symbolic significance for many people in the, Russian, in, the Rus in the Russian state. And what had Volkov done with a photograph of this statue? He had pixelated her face green. There we are. That's what he'd done. And um, apparently this was a source of outrage to uh, some of the more patriotic elements within the Russian state. And uh, there were protests against this. And a, a criminal investigation is embarked upon. And it's personally supervised by our old friend, Mr. Masterikin, the head of the investigative committee, the man we saw uh, in earnest discussions with the president a few minutes ago. Now, it's such an important point, this, that an investigator is dispatched from Moscow to Volgograd to investigate the crime um, uh, to collect, and to collect evidence. Now, given that the crime occurred in cyberspace, no statues were harmed during the perpetration of this supposed crime. But Mr. Volkov, the unfortunate Mr. Volkov, finds himself charged under... Article 243 of the Criminal Code, which I read, read out, but you've already, already, already read it. Um, destruction or damage of monuments of history shall be a criminal offence. And um, you may think we're entering a rather surreal world, that, the, that, that you might think that Article 243 was directed at people coming and painting the, the, the sculpture or hacking away at it or something like that. This occurred in cyberspace. Um, the, the, the courts were not to be dissuaded by that. And uh, Mr. Volkov was duly fined uh, in 2019 for his crime. Now, the other article that Mr. Volkov was apparently prosecuted under was another article of, of the code introduced in 2014 and generally known as the Law Against the Rehabilitation of Nazism. Here it is. Here's some extracts from it. It's now a crime to deny facts recognised by the International Military Tribunal, i.e. the Nuremberg Tribunal, to approve of the crimes the Nuremberg Tribunal judged, and then, more problematically, one might think, to spread intentionally false information about the Soviet Union's activities during the Second War. Fourthly, to spread information on military and memorial commemorative dates related to Russia's defence that is clearly disrespectful 
of society and to publicly desecrate symbols of Russia's military glory. That is the uh, a set of provisions introduced in 2014, under which Mr. Volkov was additionally charged. The maximum sentence for crimes within this general category is a uh, maximum sentence, three years in prison. Now, the, it's of course the case that various European states have introduced criminal offences of Holocaust denial. Um, but we, well, we're clearly very far removed from that type of offence when we look at Article 354. Um, and it has been used expansively, this article, um, by the Russian prosecution authorities since 2014, effectively to outlaw versions of Russian history or, and Soviet history which run counter to, and which run counter to that version that the Russian state wishes to promulgate. Uh, a, a version which, as many of you will have, have seen in the newspapers and in the magazine, uh, etc., where the Russian state now uh, uh, has a narrative of its own history, especially its history during the Second World War, which is of unquestioning glorification of every step taken in, uh, during the Second War, and indeed uh, more broadly. And what we see in the prosecutions that have occurred under this section is the de deployment of the criminal law to impose upon the state a narrative which effectively and can equate any form of critique of Russian state activity of the past into a form of Nazism. And of course, we've, in the last six or seven months, we've seen that uh, very vividly in action. Now, one consequence of this law has been in practice that any historical discussion about uh, the cooperation between Hitler and Stalin before the Second World War, about any suggestions that any kind of war crimes might have been perpetrated by the Red Army during the war, questioning the activities of the Russian, the Soviet state in the post-war period and during its occupation of the East European countries, can now be qualified, or uh, can now be characterized, I should say, as a form of rehabilitation of Nazism. It would probably be a crime now in Russia to publish these very famous cartoons from the 1930s. A nice piece of Poland, and this, of course, very famous David Lowe, I think, cartoon. Um, it's not very, not very well portrayed here. The scum of the earth, I presume, and, the, and Mr. Star, uh, um, Mr. Stalin says some similar words back to Herr Hitler, as they look over the corpse of Poland. To publish these cartoons now in Russia could well be a criminal offence. Now, you think, is this an exaggeration, you may think? Well, let me give you an example of a prosecution, a recent prosecution under this section. A, a blogger, an entirely innocuous blogger called Vladimir Luzgin, is convicted in perm under this offence for having reposted on a, on a social media uh, site in, in, in Russia an article which asserts that the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany, and I quote, actively collaborated in dividing Europe according to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, jointly attacked Poland and unleashed the Second World War. And this gentleman, Luzgin, was convicted of circulation of false information about the activities of the USSR during the World War II, a conviction that was upheld by the Supreme Court of Russia. Now, there are two things to say, to my mind, about that conviction. The first is, think about what kind of a state it is that actually criminalises discussion about its own past. It's as if the British Parliament here was to pass a law that criminalised the questioning of the morality of the concentration camps set up by the British during the Boer War, or, to, or criminalised the questioning of the, Dred, the, the Dresden bombings of 1944 and 1945. That's essentially what is being done. Secondly, and perhaps even more fundamentally, what the article that this unfortunate individual posted said was nothing more than the truth. In 1939, in September 1939, 
Germany invaded Poland from one side, and a few couple of weeks later, Russia invaded Poland from the other side. And by the 6th of October of that year, Poland had effectively ceased to exist. It had been divided in accordance with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of a few weeks earlier between Germany and the Soviet Union. Now, Alexei Navalny is never far away from these uh, legal developments, these ominous legal developments. After he had been convicted uh, uh, or sent to prison on the 2nd of February of last year, as I've mentioned, he found himself back in court a month later. Why was he back in court? He was back in court because he had criticised a Russian state propaganda video which had been made trying to promote proposed amendments to the Russian constitution which were designed, these amendments were, one of them was to allow the incumbent president to stand, if he wished, for another two terms as president. There was a limit previously and that, of course, as you know, that limit has now been altered. And there were various voices on this video. There were people from all walks of life voicing their support for this wonderful change to the proposed change to the constitution. One of them one of the voices was a 94-year-old World War II veteran. Navalny took exception to this video, and in his blunt way, he described the participants in it as corrupt hacks. Now, you may think it's rather rude, a rather rude thing to say, and a rather rude way to speak. But rudeness, in English terms at least, is not equated with criminality. Needless to say, Navalny was prosecuted uh, in this, in this instance, for insulting a Second World War veteran. Um, now, on this occasion, he was not given a separate criminal uh, a cre prison sentence, and only because, through some grievous omission on the part of the Russian criminal code, the, the offence he was charged under did not carry a prison sentence. Now, this was a source of great agitation uh, in the Duma, after this, that, that Navalny had not been given a condign sentence, uh, and this was quickly and swiftly remedied. And um, a, a new law was introduced swiftly in, in March of 2021, where it is now uh, uh, a, a crime to publicly disseminate knowingly false information about World War II veterans. Um, and the state speaker said... It is unacceptable to insult those who defend the motherland. It is that who defended the motherland. It is our duty to protect the memory of our grandfathers and great grandfathers, thanks to whom we are alive today. You'll understand now why um, it is now considered rather dangerous by Russian libraries and bookshops to stock books by eminent and objective historians of the Second World War, such as Anthony Beaver and John. Keegan. Um, now, the use of the courts to rewrite history extends even further. And uh, although I haven't got time to go into it now, we have a scenario of multiple prosecutions against individuals who have sought, since the fall of communism, to, uh, uh, rev to remember and bring to bear, and bring back into the public memory the crimes perpetrated during the Soviet uh, Union period. And attempts of, of remembrance uh, and accountability in respect of the crimes of, say, the Great Terror of the 1930s have led to oppression against the individuals who sought to do that. And many of you will remember that last year, the... the remarkable NGO set up in Russia immediately after the fall of communism called Memorial, designed to remember the victims of Soviet oppression, was banned uh, uh, and has been effectively liquidated by uh, a, 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 Russian, a Russian court. And uh, I've noticed the time, so insofar as you want to know about that, there's a, a truly a, appalling story, which I mention in the, in the lecture notes, which will be published o online. Um, we move to February 2022 with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, where the war against truth um, moves up yet a further notch. The, in, in March 2022, the so-called Russian fake news law is brought in, now making it uh, a, a criminal offence 
sentenceable by up to 15 years in prison to knowingly disseminate false information about the Russian armed forces or to discredit them. And, I mean, you'll have read about this, this offence which, under which many, many prosecutions have ensued. The most egregious, perhaps, is of a gentleman... That's... Uh, I, I've missed over that. Um, this gentleman here, a very brave man called Alexei Goronov, who, a local politician who, after the invasion had started, said these words, how can we talk about a children's drawing competition, that being the subject matter, presumably, of the local government discussion, when children are dying every day, about 100 children have been killed in Ukraine, and children are becoming orphans. I believe that all effort of civil society should be aimed at stopping war and withdrawing troops from Ukraine, this gentleman said at a, at a political meeting or a council meeting in March of 2022. He was sentenced in July of this year to seven years in prison. Seven, seven years in prison for uttering those words. Um, I finally revert back to Alexei Navalny. We left him last in a, in a penal colony, colony in February 2021, um, serving his suspended sentence that had been de-suspended. Has he been... Is he being allowed to just see out his sentence unharried by the authorities? You'll be unsurprised to know the answer is no. He was prosecuted in March of this year for under fresh embezzlement charges, this time of apparently stealing money from his own anti-corruption organisation to the tune of $4.7 million. And he was found guilty in March of this year and sentenced to nine years in a maximum security prison. The heart of the charge is that he raised money for his presidential campaign, knowing that he would be unable to participate in it because of this conviction, and therefore he defrauded his uh, political donors who had funded his campaign. And even now, further charges are being levelled against him for being a member of a so-called extremist organisation. Um, being his own anti-corruption organisation, now designated as so-called ex an extremist organisation. It seems absolutely clear that the attitude of the authorities is to keep Navalny in prison essentially forever. Um, and there was an extraordinary article, a very interesting article yesterday in the Sunday Times by Mark Galliotti, who's, as you will know, a very uh, uh, interesting um, figure who writes about Russia and, and is a great expert on Russia, who likened the current trajectory of Russia to the, it's turning into a version of North Korea. I think it's fair to say that Navalny's own personal experience from the optimism of the late 90s, from the, the birth of some form of democracy in the late 90s and early 2020s, uh, the early 2000s, into the state uh, that it's now become, into his own predicament, uh, is testament to that miserable and tragic trajectory. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. A really beautiful presentation. Can I ask, kick off the questioning by asking you um, to comment on the fact that, first of all, we're seeing an equivalent use of the law by Trump and others in the United States as a repeated lit litiginous strategy. So at what point does the legal profession itself become complicit in the actions of a state? Gosh, that is a, um, that is a, very, that is a very difficult question. The, I mean, on, one, on one view, a lawyer, an independent lawyer such as myself, I, a self-employed, I mean, and, and in England, prosecutions and defences are covered, are, are handled, not, not entirely, but often handled by independent, um, self-employed barristers such as, such as myself. And if you are, as a prosecution, as a barrister, instructed by the prosecution to present a prosecution, then you are, it's not for you to question the, the, uh, uh, the wisdom of that prosecution. What you can't do as a independent self-employed barrister in, in England is continue a prosecution which you know to be either hopeless or you, or you know to be or believe to be 
uh, bogus and that it's your obligation at that stage to withdraw from the prosecution and it's your obligation to cease the prosecution. Now, one of the glories of the... Um, speaking patriotically and in my, own, in my own defense, one of the glories of the English legal system is that it, in, it, it has this body of people who are independent, self-employed self -employed barristers who handle prosecutions as well as defenses. And one of the downsides of a state prosecution service is that effectively it, in, it doesn't allow for independence of mind. A, a barrister in England asked to prosecute a case who takes the view that the case is in, cannot properly be brought because of lack of evidence or a concern about the motives behind the prosecution, will unhesitatingly say, this prosecution must be brought to an end. When you have a state prosecution service, then, of course, those checks and balances, that independence of mind, goes. You have an individual who's employed by the state to... to and it, his or her income and continued employment may well depend on actually continuing the prosecution and not asking those hard questions about the validity of the, of the, of, of, of the prosecution. Fortunately, in England, we have a, although we have a Crown Prosecution Service as well, which is in, set up with a number of employees, it is a, a, a very independent, independent org organisation with the result that we have a, the rule of law exists in this country in a way that, although we have criticisms of, of events in the, in the criminal law, no doubt, ultimately the rule of law survives in this, it survives in this country. That's a very, very long answer to a short question. I apologise for that, Martin. No, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could sort of perhaps comment on what the potential trajectory is for this. Because if, for example, you say that the intention is to keep Alexei Navalny in prison, you know, indefinitely presumably to sort of insulate him from, you know, criticising Putin. If the scenario is when Putin is eventually not in power anymore, do you think there's potential for some sort of, you know, addressing of these sort of like, injustices or will state power maintain its sort of position and keep these people in prison because it'll, they'll just criticise the next person if they don't, you know? Very interesting question. I mean, I presume... Navalny must have... I mean, the, the bravery of the return to Russia, I don't think can be overstated, given that he will have known that he was returning to, or despite the fact that he'd been the victim of an assassination attempt, he must have known that he would be arrested on whatever charge they could work out and would be um, by this... You know, the, the, the rule of law has been gradually eroding in Russia over a protracted period of time, and by February 2021, he was not in a healthy state. So Navalny foresaw precisely... The, the outcome of any return. So he foresaw that he would be imprisoned. And I mean, whether he could foresee precisely for how long, I don't know. I'm not privy to that information. But it was an extraordinarily brave decision. And one assumes that the political calculus behind it was that I, from a prison cell, will become a beacon of, um, uh, of justice and of opposition, even though I'm partially, if not entirely, silenced from going about the kind of activities that I was engaging in. Presumably the calculus was that I will become this symbol of oppression and opposition from a prison cell. And of course, one's seen that over in history. And of course, the most obvious example is Nelson Mandela. He spent 28 years in a prison cell between 1962 and 1989, 1990. And even from a prison cell became the most famous political prisoner in the world, became one of the most famous men in the world. And it may be that the same trajectory is being foreseen by, by Navalny. Of course, you ask, what about if Putin falls? Of course, if he does, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't pre present, pretend to be a great expert in any way on, 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 on that question. Um, if he falls, I mean, it's, it's of course a common event that when, if there is a change of government, if there's a change of government from a a groundswell of opposition from the people, then, then uh, one assumes he will, one, just, like, just like happened to Mandela in the late 80s and early 90s. He will be released to become the binding figure within Russia. But I'm, I'm, the, 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 the difference between um, Mandela and Navalny, sadly, is that Mandela was the, was, was the, the hero of 80% of the... So of the South African population. Navalny is a hero to many people, but there is still in Russia, through the propaganda techniques that have been so vigorously and effectively uh, perpetrated in, 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 in Russia, he is not 
It's not as if there's, there's 80% of the population are Navalnyites who are only disabled from, from rising up through state oppression. Putin has still got very substantial support amongst the <laughs> Russian population. Navalny is not an overwhelmingly popular figure in Russia. You might find that surprising, given that everything he stands for is essentially positive, as against everything that Putin stands for, which to our liberal eyes in the West is essentially negative. Um, but that misstates the... I mean, there are... You know, liberalism in Russia is not, has not got a, a, it's not embedded in any way. The, in, even in the relatively free elections of the past, li the liberal parties of Russia generally attracted very small votes. And the, the annexation of the Crimea in 2015 was an enormously popular event in, 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 within, within Russia. So, you know, I, it's a very interesting question you ask. I don't have an immediate answer, but I don't think we're... Navalny is in a position where he thinks that when there is a change of government, he'll be released and gloriously become the sort of main politician within Russia. I think that's very unlikely, sadly, sadly, because the values he stands for are values which are very close to the values which we take for granted in this country, and which the, the West takes for granted. Thank you, Thomas. I'm really sorry that I'm going to have to draw the questioning to an end because we have to have the hall back. I'm not sure that the... Um Liberal Party in this country would feel equally optimistic about their future. Well, liberals, <laughs> liberalism in the broadest sense of the term. Yeah. But um, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture and a very moving one. And perhaps we will have you back in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.